All right, thanks, Kate. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'll try to take some questions during the presentation. I'll try to catch them on the chat if I can, but if not, we'll leave some time at the end for questions as well. So first, I just want to say thank you to Kate and the Natural Areas Association for this opportunity to share some information on our project. Uh, and it's a really great response. And so I want to thank folks who are joining in today live on the webinar, the folks who registered, as well as folks who might be viewing the YouTube video uh, in the future. Um, I hope that you find this information useful for, for your program of work. So thank you very much. Um, I want to start by stressing a couple points. So first of all, uh, this is a huge project and it's still a work in progress. So I'm going to be sharing a lot of resources today that are nearing completion. So uh, we won't have final versions of this right now, but in the, new, in the near future, in the next few months, we'll be rolling out a lot of these products. And so hopefully I'll be able to work with Kate and the NAA and others to share the announcements when these products are finally available. But right now we're in sort of the final stages of, of uh, the draft. Another thing I want to stress, uh, which is probably the most important, is that this is a large project, as I, as I mentioned, and there are a lot of people involved in this work. And so up front, I just want to acknowledge uh, the groups that are involved in this project. So, so first of all, um, this is a Federal Highways Administration project, so it's funded through the Federal Highways Administration, and it's their deliverables that uh, we're creating. Um, and we have a bunch of groups that are developing content and sharing data for these utilities and um, these resources. So folks from the Forest Service Pacific Northwest region, um, folks from WSP, which is an international professional design services firm, uh, folks from the Chicago Botanic Garden are providing some data for this project, as well as Jennifer Hopwood from the Xerces Society of Invertebrate Conservation. So uh, this work would not happen with a lot of, um, without the input of the folks on the screen. I want to share a bit about the motivation for this work. Again, I mentioned that it's a Federal Highways Administration project, and it's really um, in response to a couple of key documents that came out in the last year or so, one of which was the Presidential Memorandum on um, uh, Pollinators. So this, this memorandum you may be familiar with, uh, it worked to create a federal strategy to promote and conserve uh, important pollinator species. Uh, the strategy came out in 2015. Um, they've developed an action plan in 2016. And a real key to this, a real goal for this um, memorandum was to restore or enhance 7 million acres of land for pollinators over the next five years. So that's a really big uh, objective. And in response to this, the Federal Highways Administration looked at their infrastructure, their right-of-ways, and thought that uh, that acreage or that land would be um, a good opportunity to support uh, pollinators and to support this memo. Another document that this that helped motivate this project was the National Seed Strategy, the Interagency Seed Strategy. I'm sure it's another document that you are, most of you are familiar with. Uh, the Federal Highways Administration is a signatory on this document. And um, one of the goals, goal three, uh, uh, was motivation for this work, and that's to develop tools that enable managers to make timely informed seeding decisions for restoration. So the idea is that we want to help practitioners do their job to address this, uh, to address their restoration work um, uh, with our utility. So I'm going to talk about a series of uh, um, resources, and the first thing I want to talk about is a technical resource from the Federal Highways Administration. It's uh, known as the Revegetation Manual. I'm sure some of you are familiar with this uh, original document. It was published in 2007. Uh, we call it the manual, but it's, it's really a technical guide or a technical report from the Federal Highways Administration, their Western and Federal Lands Office. Uh, and, and you can see here the original authors, um, mainly Forest Service folks, uh, basically created the content for this report. And I just want to acknowledge David Steinfeld, who is the lead author on the original report, uh, came back to help us with this, this revision, this recent revision, which was amazing. So David has a a breadth and depth of knowledge and restoration, and he's put a lot of uh, work into this book, and it's, it's a very useful resource. 
Uh, the original was about 424 pages, so it was, it was a small phone book, uh, but it was really packed full of technical information for practitioners. Um, the original one aspect was that it was really Western-centric, so it came out of the Pacific Northwest region, mainly as a proof of concept to uh, demonstrating some of these, uh, um, some of the practices in this book in arid environments uh, uh, that we find in the Pacific Northwest, as well as in the very rainy environments that we find here. Uh, the real key with this document was that it was it's applicable to any any highly disturbed sites. So we talk a lot about road sites and transportation infrastructure, but the information in this book can be applied anywhere where you are um, doing restoration or reclamation, whatever term you want to use. Uh, this original document was circulated pretty broadly. Uh, there was a lot of requests for this book internationally as well as domestically, and we provided a series of trainings with this book. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, and we've used modules from this uh, to work with folks overseas as well. And so uh, it's become a really powerful training resource. I'm not gonna dive into the real details of the book, but basically it treats revegetation as a process. And the, the one real goal is to try to integrate revegetation early on in, um, in project planning and design. So the idea is that Revegetation is not an afterthought, especially when it comes to designing transportation projects. Uh, and so the, this process starts with project orientation and inventory, site analyses, um, revegetation plans, uh, implementation, and then finally monitoring and maintenance. And so the book walk, walks you through these different aspects, um, uh, as well as providing some implementation guides. I think the real key component here is that uh, about 60% of this book are implementation guides. And so these are very, detailed and technical um, chapters. Um, I will, how do we, there's a question come in and how do we get a copy of the roadside revegetation manual? I will share that information soon. Uh, in short, I think there's still a few paper copies out there, but we do have PDF versions on a website I'm going to show later. So uh, I'll point you in the right direction for all that. Um, so part of this book has soil and site treatment, how to plant, obtain plant materials, installing materials as well as their care. And it really just highlights how you balance the limiting factors on a given site with your project objectives and how that informs your plant materials and uh, um, design and, and everything else. So that's the original uh, and as part of this project, Federal Highways Administration and the Forest Service wanted to update this, this document. Um, so what we've done now, this is about a 10-year update, so obviously a lot happens in, in our subdiscipline or our field, and so uh, we want to incorporate new information as we can into this document, um, as well as broaden the scope to a national scope. So this document was peer-reviewed by a technical review committee. And so what that's allowed us to do is incorporate regional caveats to the book. So for example, a hydro seeding practice in Oregon is not the same as it is in Iowa. Same holds true for soil amendments like fertilizer. Uh, there's regional differences in all this work, and so we tried to capture that a little bit, or at least let people um, be aware of some of these differences. So there's not a one-size-fits-all for a lot of things that we do on the ground. Um, obviously, going back to the, the presidential memo, um, we wanted to incorporate a discussion of pollinators and their importance. So it talks about ne nectar and shelter needs, phenology of plants, and how that informs plant palate selection. Um, and a, a part of that discussion is we wanted to incorporate the um, Federal Highways and Xerxes Society best management practices for, uh, uh, into this book, specifically how to support pollinators on roadsides. And Jennifer Hopwood with the Xerxes Society has just been amazing in trying to incorporate as much of their work as possible into this, into this document. And so again, understanding pollinators helps to inform how one might change their management practice or their maintenance um, to support pollinators. Uh, and that information was lacking in the original. And obviously, you know, if you're, if you're talking about pollinators and you're talking about Xerxes Society, so having them on board is, is um, really great. And so we came up with a draft, um, addition in September 2016, before the change in uh, the administration. And we actually changed the title to really focus on pollinators. So it's 
an integrated approach to establishing native plants and pollinator habitat. So that reflects this emphasis on pollinators. So, so back to Robin's question, uh, where can we find these guides? So, uh, nativerevegetation.org is currently the site that we're housing this information on. And so on this site, among other resources that I'll talk about in a bit, you can find these guides. You can find the original 2007 version in a sort of print layout form. And you can find our version 1.1 update there as well. And you can kind of see where we're heading with this last release. For the 2017 update, we anticipate a uh, PDF document, an HTML uh, document, as well as an e-reader flipbook, flipbook for mobile devices. So the idea is you can download a chapter in PDF, you can download the whole thing, you can just surf it online and click through the chapters as you wish, uh, where hyperlinks will take you to cross-reference chapters and pictures and things like that, or you can download the um, flipbook for your tablet, et cetera. So nativerevegetation.org is the home for this stuff right now. So along with the guide, I want to talk about this resource library that's on this website as well. So does anybody have any other questions on the, uh, the guide before I move on? Sounds good. Okay. Um, so this website uh, is in the process of being updated as well. So I wouldn't just rush off and, and go to this site right away because we're updating um, everything as we go. But in addition to the guides and this future release that uh, we'll be releasing in the next few months, there are other resources on this website. And the ones that I want to focus on here are this re resource library where we have a series of reports and other types of literature that we've asked folks, you know, what are some of the most relevant pieces of literature that you use for your job, or whether they're reports or internal documents or public domain, what can we uh, share with folks, what's, what's okay to share with folks who might uh, have some questions on some of these pretty technical processes. Um, and so we have this resource library, we've sort of high graded documents that we wanna put in here, that we put in here. And we're continuing to update this, this uh, site. So when you look at report type here, you can see that we have contract specs, we have literature, reports, maybe presentations from uh, some experts, uh, the roadside guides in there, as well as some worksheets um, and software programs that may be useful for doing things like seed calculations, seed need calculations, uh, and things like that. So the idea is you can search this resource library to see if there's something that's uh, relevant to your needs. Uh, in terms of topic type, we cover pretty broad range of things. So everything from mulch, uh, soil amendment, and bioengineering, uh, as well as wildlife and pollinators now, um, planning, and um, um, other, uh, even you know, things like cuttings and fertilizer. So pretty detailed stuff. So if you're looking for a transportation report on the use of fertilizer, you know, maybe it's in here. And if it's not, hopefully in the future, we'll be able to get information from folks on what they might want to see in this resource library. The idea is that we'll keep it live and keep updating it uh, for as long as we can. And as mentioned earlier, uh, the guides, the, the original guide as well as these newer iterations will be available on this website. And again, this last iteration hopefully will be ready sometime uh, uh, soon. We'll let you know. So moving on to this, uh, a new utility that's been, that we're developing, it's called the Eco-Regional Revegetation Application, or the ERA. Uh, and this is, this is something new uh, for this project, again, coming out of the motivation to help practitioners uh, uh, get work done on the ground. So the objectives for this, uh, utility were to again to support the seed strategy and the pollinator health initiatives that I mentioned at the beginning, as well as to support the native plants infrastructure, 
uh, and really assist revegetation pract uh, practitioners in project design and implementation, um, and really create a utility structured around ecoregions rather than administrative boundaries. So I've got a question coming in talking, asking about uh, do we address plastic monofilament netting uh, for erosion control um, and they're seeing some negative impacts on wildlife. Materials like this are discussed in the book and I think most, as, as often as we can, we try to uh, point out when these products may be good to use, maybe not when they're not good to use. And so for this particular product in your region, I'm not necessarily sure, but we do try to point out issues like this when um, we're aware of them. There's a whole discussion of plant pathology and insects and disease and things like that as well. So uh, being aware of what things may be in a nursery that you don't want to uh, spread around in, in the native landscape and things like that. Um, and so that basically the, this utility would be structured around ecoregions rather than administrative boundaries. Uh, you can find a lot of plant lists and a lot of reports based on uh, a, a state DOT or a BLM district or a forest. You know, but we want to have something that has a really broad structure to it, and ecoregions really are biologically meaningful and uh, um, uh, I think give a better way to organize some of this data and use this data. In terms of the audience, we're, again, we're talking about practitioners and project designers, and this is for all agencies and sectors, um, and this utility as well is uh, national in scope. So I guess I want to say the, the punchline for this slide is that we are not operating in a vacuum. Uh, there's always po possibly some, some discussions when you try to share something nationally and at the regional level, oftentimes there may be some disconnect between what people believe should be happening in one region versus another, as well as sort of, you know, why do we have a national uh, utility when our regional information works just fine? But, and so what we wanted to try to do is capture that regional information in this, in this utility, in this data. And so in terms of data sources, when we're talking about pollinator-friendly species, you can see a whole list of organizations and sources here that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And really, Mark Skinner, our regional botanist in the Pacific Northwest Region of the Forest Service, uh, spent a lot of time making a pollinator database for the NRCS in his previous position. Uh, so he's really the lead on taking um, uh, collecting a lot of this data, but we have folks from Xerxes Society again, uh, some data from Jennifer Hopwood and her colleagues, uh, Pollinator Partnership and other resources. Obviously, USDA plant state distribution data was used, and then Abby White and Andrew Kramer are um, contributing uh, commercial availability data to this, this data set. We spent a lot of time trying to validate this information with regional experts, so Forest Service and Bale and Botanists, as well as uh, DOT, landscape architects, and others. So we feel like we did a pretty good job reaching out to collect the data that's available, whether it's published or, or otherwise. So for all that data, we have about 51 fields of information. Plant characteristics, uh, as you can imagine, the standard characteristics, uh, but ecoregion was important, as well as pollinator value. A lot of things kind of go into pollinator value. Uh, and as well as commercial availability. So is it a workhorse species? Is it a commercially available? Is it a good pollinator plant? Is it not? Is it a larval host plant or is it a food source, et cetera? Uh, this is just a draft um, summary of the data. I've included, or we've included a um, number of species by family. For those of you who are more botanically inclined, you can take a look at this and, and see how the numbers break out. But in short, uh, we identified about 1,600 workhorse and pollinator, uh, spe or workhorse species that are pollinator friendly. We identified about 1,300 species that are important for pollinators, but maybe not a workhorse species. And then about 889 species um, that were defined as workhorse species. Again, there's a few different definitions for workhorse species, but obviously these are species that are used frequently. So oftentimes or, or they usually have to be commercially available. So that kind of um, informs whether it's a workhorse or not. Uh, in terms of workhorse slash pollinator, uh, these are species that we know are important for pollinators for a given reason, 
uh, they're commercially available and they have a high value, so they're they're considered sort of a workhorse pollinator species versus these species, these pollinator species, where maybe they are important for pollinators, but perhaps they're not commercially available or perhaps they're not frequently used, and so therefore they don't have a workhorse designation, unless it's a real brief summary of sort of how the data was uh, organized. This is, shows the taxonomic breakdown of the animals that are supported. Oops that are supported by uh, these plants. And so you can see uh, out of all plants and native plants, the numbers of species that support these different animal species. So again, whether it's broken down by moths, butterflies, uh, whether it's something to larval host, specifically for monarchs or butterflies in general, we have stretched, uh, nesting and structure uh, species. Um, and you can see how they break down according to animals that they support. And again, this is just a brief, brief summary for you to look at. So in terms of commercial availability, I just want to acknowledge that Abby White, uh, this is her thesis, her master's thesis data. So she recently graduated from Northwestern uh, out of Andrea Kramer's lab. And so this commercial availability da data that we're bringing into this utility are, are, have been generated by Abby. And this just shows you sort of a breakdown of uh, the type of you know, plant species we're talking about and whether it's in commercial production or not, and how that compares to the number of plants we're familiar with in the USDA plants database. So for example, about 21% of forbs that we know about are in commercial production. And so there's something about something about uh, 5,600 species here uh, in, this, in this data set. You can see, um, you know, trees, for example, is a higher proportion of uh, species that are in commercial production, as you can imagine. Um, as well as grasses and others and shrubs. This shows the distribution by state. So uh, you can look at the number of vendors that are uh, um, out there. And I should point out that Abby, this isn't just an online search. I, I don't know the percentage, but there's a lot of vendors that don't have websites and so she spent a lot of time talking to vendors, um, querying them via email and other ways to try to capture the what the basically the commercial market is in the United States, which I think is is pretty interesting. And I don't think we have a a, a good source of that information outside of the, outside of her work. So you can see where some of these states have very few vendors. Um, where states like Oregon, for example, we're well over 100 vendors. Florida is over 100 vendors. And you can see how this breaks out by by state. Uh, again, because ecoregions are our, our structure for all of this, you can look at the vendor distribution by uh, EPA level three ecoregion. And a lot of this makes sense to me. You can see a lot of areas that have a really high density of um, vendors because it's easy to grow plants there, whereas someplace uh, like the arid west, it's much, difficult to, much more difficult to grow plants at a um, consumer or agricultural scale. So there's, there's fewer vendors in some of these areas. So all that data that I just just uh, zoomed through pretty quickly um, is going into an online spatially uh, designed or structured database. And so I want to acknowledge Shane Roberts with WSP. Uh, he's really the lead on on helping to de develop this online tool for this for this project. And it's going to have a standard map based interface that we're used to. Uh, um, um, along with the ecoregion data. So this will be organized by level three EPA um, ecoregions. And so you'll be able to, be able to click on an um, ecoregion um, to, to uh, look through the data. The other thing I want to um, highlight uh, as, as part of this work, we have brought in the USDA Forest Service provisional seed zones data as well. I think some of you are familiar with this data, but these are the um, seed zones created by Andy Bauer, Brad Sinclair, and Vicki Erickson in 2014. Down here, uh, it's an EcoApps publication. You can look that up. 
um, or here's a website where you can go to to see these seed zones. The the these seed zones this this data has been incorporated into the spatial database that we're building now as a way to combine uh, both seed sourcing information and seed zone information in in one portal. And just as a re refresher on these seed zones, the idea is that we use these when we don't have empirical genetic evidence or genetic data for a given species. And the seed zones were designed um, with temperature and aridity bands, uh, defining the seed zones within level three ecoregions. So our ERA data is structured and organized by level three ecoregions, and our provisional seed zone data is also um, organized by level three ecoregions. And so that's the framework that we're using. So now you have this data layer with the provisional seed zones uh, in the same portal as you do our ERA data. And this is gives you an idea of the temperature and aridity zones within ecoregions. And I'm not going to, to go into data or to detail on this data, but um, there's a lot of resources describing these zones, and we're finding quite a few people are using these zones in their applied work, uh, which is really exciting. So knowing that all those layers are in there, I'm just going to show you some an example of the ERA uh, interface. Basically, you can find your project area in the map, uh, either through a location or zoning in or zooming in, and able to highlight the ecoregion that you're working in. And so, for example, here I've highlighted ecoregion 46, and uh, I've, I've found 24 plant species that are known to be good for pollinators or their workhorse species, and they're available in your, in your neighborhood there, basically. And so when I click on that field, I can see the species information that you'd get at, in, out of USDA plants database and, and some of the other resources I talked about earlier. So you can see, you can gather all the information at once to determine if it's something that you want to include in your plant palette for, for a revegetation project. Um, you can surf around the map as if you only need a few species or if you're just sort of doing some preliminary planning, or you can download the data to your local drive and work with it as you, as you need. So you can see that we can still view the data here uh, online, live on the website, or download it, as I said, uh, to your local files and uh, continue planning process from there. So I don't, I haven't given you a URL for this because uh, I'm not quite sure where it'll be living online. So the utility will have a separate URL, a separate web address, and we will share that information once the ERA goes, goes live. So just to be clear, it's not going to be housed on the, the native revegetation.org website that I, that I mentioned um, earlier. Um, that's a real brief uh, overview of these of these products. I didn't want to go into too much detail on some of them because they're still in, in draft form. But again, I just want to repeat that this this is a lot of work. It, when you think about writing a book from the beginning or trying to revise a book, uh, you kind of think, well, we'll just revise this book. Ten years later, that'll be easy. Uh, not not so much. So it's been a lot of work, but um, we've we're finding that the um, the feedback that we've gotten so far to be very positive. And I do want to acknowledge the technical review committee um, for their input into this document. So it was incredibly useful to have regional specialists um, chime in and provide information on this book. So this question, uh, when will it be going live? The utility will be going live sometime in the future. Uh, sooner than later, I mean, we're on schedule with the project, but it takes a lot of work to get this into a beta form that we can test. So again, I hope to provide um, um, updates through the NAA and other organizations to let people know that, okay, the ERA is online, please take a look. And the same holds true for the other resources. Um, with that, uh, I'm finished. I'm happy to take any questions via chat or 
voice or whatever works. So thank you. Matt, this is Kate. I just wanted to ask uh, really quickly, did you did you specify, you said you, you're not sure when this is going to actually go live. Did you have an estimate for that? I apologize if I missed that. Oh, no. I, um, in, in the next few months, probably. The, the um, technical guide is on a different time frame than the utility, the ERA, the application. Um, and I want, I want to say it's a matter of months to, before we can get to a place where we can share it. So not that far away. I'm just, uh, I, I don't want to give a date and time because you know how projects can um, speed up or slow down depending on how things are going. So Absolutely. I think, I think I can say to everyone here that when we get that information, we'll share it with our mailing list. So let's stay in touch about that so that we can announce it to our members. Okay. Oh, did, we, did, did we lose Matt? <laughs> I'm here. Oh, there you are. Okay. Um, Constant ha Constance Hausman has a question. Yeah, this is a good question. So, um, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about species that are appropriate or not. And it's not just our opinions, but also lo local experts. Um, and, you know, we present, we, we have this uh, application that we don't recommend people just start generating lists of species and going off and, and doing this work. I mean, the, re the uh, application will come with a, a short tutorial, but the, the bulk of the information is in the technical guide. So we have an entire uh, extensive chapter on the target plant concepts, um, selecting appropriate species, what's native and what's not. I mean, you can hand this to a, an expert and hopefully they'll get something out of it. But you could also hand this document to somebody who's new to the, um, this, this discipline and have them understand about, or, or have a better understanding about what's native, what's not, what's appropriate, seed zones, genetic guidelines, it's, it's all in there. So I think if somebody were, were to look at the chapter that I'm mentioning, they would be able to address Constance's question there. Um, so we, we make practitioners and project designers aware of these issues and point them to experts uh, that can help them. Oh, another comment for Robin. Thank you, Robin. Other questions? Anybody else? Ah. So yeah, what, what's your definition of native and do you have a time frame uh, for the definition? Um, that, that's a, a large discussion, obviously. Uh, I, I think that our definition of native is, is probably on the conservative side of that discussion. Uh, the, the USDA Forest Service has a pretty um, firm policy on native plants and that they need to be native to an area or, or they have to have been there historically. Uh, um, and I realize a lot of other agencies have different, um, different definitions of native that are probably more um, allowing than, or more lax than ours. Uh, so we're definitely on the conservative side and that's spelled out in the book as well. So we talk about invasive species, whether it's a noxious weed or not, and, and why species are introduced, and, and um, whether it's accidental or on purpose, and, and even some of the things that happen to these species in cultivation. So what's the difference between a, a foundation collection that, of seed that you make in the wild versus a grow out, and how that affects how, they're, how that plant, or how that seed's been affected genetically, et cetera. Um, there's a question about uh, state DOTs that require the use um, of native plants. I'm not certain if there's state policies that specifically um, denote the use of native plants. I want to say there might be a couple of DOTs that are very active in doing that and incorporating native plants, but I'm not, I don't feel comfortable to say whether or not they actually have uh, uh, policies in place or not. Um, Matt, I can chime in here. I just posted something on the Natural Areas 
Facebook page a couple few days ago. I think New Jersey might have put some legislation in place about that, but I, I don't want to be, I'm no expert, but um, I remember it being sort of an exciting uh, announcement. So that's, you know, everyone go to our Facebook page. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's definitely a variation in what the state DOTs will do. And that also applies to um, the maintenance aspect, especially in supporting pollinators. I just saw a, a news article saying that the Illinois DOT, they've, they've changed their maintenance, maintenance policy to avoid, um, to mow the roadside no more than 15 feet from the pavement. And so that way they're, they're, they're mowing the minimum amount of work or, of land to uh, provide safety, obviously, for motorists, but then to allow as much of the roadway or the right-of-way as possible to remain um, available for pollinator support, which is pretty cool. Um, there's a question about seeds versus plant materials. Other plant materials, we have a lengthy discussion about seeds uh, and hydro seeding and how it's applied. Uh, hardwood cuttings, so why would you go through the process of creating cutting beds for projects and what are the, what are the um, things you need to be aware of when you're creating cuttings? Uh, container stock and bare root stock as well. We spent a lot of time discussing how container stock can be informed by their project objectives and your limiting factors. So there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot of uh, uh, options for container stock, and so uh, we we work with folks to or we try to share with folks that it's important to strongly consider the type of container stock. One size doesn't fit all. Um, so it's a diversity of plant materials and applications uh, that are described in the book. Anybody else have a question? Um, real quick before we lose everybody here, um, I was, I'm terribly remiss in not mentioning who our partners were for the 2017 conference because, and this is notable because of our guest here, um, that one of them is the Forest Service. Um, so just to note that, um, as well as the Park Service, the Colorado Natural Heritage Program, the City of Fort Collins Natural Area Program, and Colorado State University. Just wanted to get that in before the end. Um, any more questions for Matt before we move on and wrap this up? I just want to say I really appreciate everybody who took the time to, to view this. Um, so, so thank you for this opportunity. We love to give people opportunities and thank you so much for being our guest today. Um, I want to thank Matt and the Forest Service for their participation. The archive is going to be up really soon. I try to I try to get it done right away, um, but you'll probably get an email, a follow-up email with the link. If not, you can always go to the YouTube channel, Natural Areas Association, and we post it there as soon as humanly possible. If you're not on our email list, please go to our website, naturalareas.org, and sign up. Um, and yeah, and th exactly. Thanks a lot, Matt. I also wanted to call out Candido Galvez from Spain, who joined us today. I always like seeing people uh, join us from a long ways away. So we're glad that you could hear us and join us today. Um, thanks to everyone for registering. Thank you again to Matt. And with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. See you again soon. <laughs>